Okay, welcome everybody who's uh, here and online. Uh, so today we're going to have a talk by Mohamed Abdel Fada. On, you can read the title as fast as I can. Uh, <coughs> so Mohamed joins us from the University of Stuttgart, uh, where he did his master's degree. And before that, he completed his undergraduate degree at the German University in Cairo. So he knows more languages than anybody else I know, Arabic, German, English, and learning French. So, and uh, for comparison, I barely know English. So uh, that's why he's going to present today, uh, take it away, Mohamed. All right, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. I'll be talking about hard and soft networks on chip for FPGAs. So I'm di I divided the talk into three parts to keep it simple. The first part I will motivate why we're using networks for FPGA. In the second part we'll look at the hard and soft networks and the efficiency trade-off in that space. And in the third part we'll look at integrating a hard network with the current FPGA fabric. Right. So let's start with the first part and here we have a motivation and previous work. So here's a nice schematic of an FPGA. Right? So we have some logic blocks. Uh, switch blocks and wires. And generally the switch blocks and the wires are called the interconnect of the FPGA. And they're used to connect the logic blocks in many flexible ways to implement the functions as you know. Of course this picture is wrong. Now we have hard blocks as well. And that implements widely used functions very efficiently, such as block RAM or multipliers. Or recently we also have whole processor cores embedded onto the FPGA in hard logic. And more importantly, we have these hard interfaces. So we have things like DDR and Ethernet and PCIe, which are crucial to the commercial success of FPGAs, actually. So the first thing that you'll notice is that the interconnect is still the same. We're still using the low-level interconnect made out of short wires. And it's, although we really upgraded the logic, we raised the abstraction of the logic, the speed of it as well. But the interconnect is basically still the same, and it's used to connect these hard the hard blocks which are much faster. Right? So let's take DDR for example. It can run up to 800 megahertz and a double data rate that's 1600 uh, megabits per second or 1600 megahertz. Hard blocks can be as fast as 800 megahertz while the, um, the normal logic and interconnect of the FPGA is still at 200 megahertz. So this speed gap poses a large problem. So let's list the uh, problems of the current interconnect on the right here. So the first problem is this bandwidth issue. We have a lot of data coming off chip, and we need to handle it at these very slower, or relatively slower speeds of the FPGA. Right? The second problem is time enclosure. We want to meet the timing constraints of these hard blocks, and it's becoming more and more difficult to do with the slow interconnect. In fact, to do that, we have to go parallel. So for DDU. DDR, for example, we have 64 pins exposed to the FPGA. And what we do is that we really parallelize it to down convert it from 1600 megahertz to 200 megahertz into something like a 512 bit wide bus. And we must carry that data across the whole FPGA and close time about that. So that is a big issue in, uh, in FPGA designs, right? Another more fundamental problem is that wire speed is not scaling too well. Any FPGA design, you'll find that most of the delay is actually interconnect dominated. And we think that a change in design style would be needed to take into account that wire delay. And finally, a subtle point is that this low level of interconnect abstraction is actually a barrier to dividing a design into separate modules. And we want to do that because that will encourage <coughs> new exciting applications, such as you know, parallel compilation to speed up the compile tools and partial reconfiguration, for example, and multi-chip interconnect. And we'll come back to those later as well. OK, so I want to compare an FPGA to a city. Here we see an old city with you know, small blocks and very narrow streets between them. And you know, we, we can consider each group of buildings as a logic block, right? And because we generate very little traffic in a small city, we can handle it with the narrow streets you know, between those blocks. However, when we move towards a larger city, that's not the case anymore. I mean, granted, we still have the logic block, we still have the small streets connecting them, but we also have very, you know, very large buildings or hard blocks, right? You have the shopping malls, you have the high-rise buildings, you have the companies, so these generate a lot of traffic. And more importantly, you have, you know, the hard interfaces, like the airports or the train stations, 
And to connect all that, it's no longer sufficient to use you know, narrow streets, even if they're very long. You need to use some super highways with, uh, you know, with a lot of dynamic switching. Between. So what I want to convey here is that we want to keep the roads, but we want to augment that with some freeways to handle the extra traffic that we're dealing with. Right? By the way, can anyone guess where those two pictures are from? Barcelona. Yeah, you're correct. So that's Barcelona and that's Los Angeles. Very good. <coughs> that was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty famous. Okay. So that's what we want to do. We think that these superhighways should be implemented as networks on chip for the FPJ. So it should look something like this. And so the network on chip is composed of routers and links. So if we want to move data from you know, external memory to this green block here, it will just you know, go on one of these fast links. The first router will decide where it will go next, decides it want to go down. And here we will move it from our, you know, our network on chip or our highway to the normal streets. So we'll take an off-ramp and go to our you know, green block. So that's what we think, uh, how we think we should use this network. And so I still have the problems with the regular interconnect listed here. We'll see how the network can ease or uh, overcome some of these problems. So because we know where the bandwidth is coming from on the FPGA, so it's coming from these hard interfaces and these hard blocks that generate a lot of traffic, we can pre-design the network in order to be tailored to that kind of traffic pattern. So with that in mind, we don't have to use the regular interconnect, which is really unstructured. We can structure it in a way to take into account that amount of traffic. Um, another point is that it can improve time enclosure. We'll see later how we can run the network faster than the FPGA, you know, um, the FPGA speed. And we'll, we'll see how it, will, uh, how it will happen at this point. In addition, the network links are reusable, so you can use the same link if you're coming and going to different places. So this will really improve on uh, link utilization. Or, and obviously use less interconnect and make the CAD problem simpler and so on. Regarding wire speed, uh, we, we see the network being used with a latency tolerant communication. If you're using a network, you have to tolerate multiple hops on your links or on your data communication, basically. And so the wire speed doesn't matter anymore. If you have a lot of delay or a little delay, you should be able to tolerate that, typically using request and acknowledge signals or something. And the last point, uh, we think that the network provides a higher level of abstraction that will favor modularity instead of being a barrier to it. And so take, for example, these four modules on the FPGA. If they only communicate through the network, then there will be no critical timing paths going between them. That means they're timing disjoint, and you can compile them in parallel. Um, so that will really speed up the CAT tools, possibly, or potentially. Another point is partial reconfiguration. So current vendor tools are actually reserving wire tracks for so, so to be able to route, you know, a partially reconfigured module, but like you don't have to do that if you have a network. If you just hook up to any of the network, you know, routers, then you're already connected to the whole FPGA. So we think that would really ease things like partial reconfiguration. So you can just swap out the module and it's instantly connected to the rest of the FPGA. As for multi-chip interconnect, as I said, we can tolerate latency on the links, so we don't care how long it takes between chips. To, uh, to communicate, basically. So connecting multiple chips can possibly be transparent to the end user. OK, so we, we're not going to tackle all that you know, today, but we think that there are exciting things to look forward to. And today, we'll be talking about how to build this network. So there are <coughs> two obvious options. We can either build it out of soft logic, so configure it onto the FPGA fabric as a soft network, out of LUTs and so on. Or we can embed it onto the FPGA as a hard, unchangeable logic. Or we can actually have a mix approach. We can build parts of it soft and parts of it uh, in hard logic. Right? So a soft network has the advantage of being built, you know, tailored to your application. You don't need to build all the features in your routers. You don't need to build the whole network. Like you only tailor it to the communication that you have. While the, the hard network has to be over-provisioned for the worst case for the you know, highest traffic application that will come on your, uh, that is possibly implemented on your FPGA. On the other hand, the hard network is much faster and much, uh, much smaller, 
versus a very slow and big soft network. So basically it's an efficiency versus configurability trade-off and that's exactly what we will investigate in this work. And uh, specifically we'll look at area and delay of a hard and soft network divided into its basic components. Right, so there's a lot of previous work about you know FPGA tuned soft networks so how to best build the soft network out of the FPGA fabric and that's mainly been based on FPGA utilization so if I have more you know more LUTs I should use more of them because there's more of it on the FPGA so we also give some design recommendations but based on FPGA silicon area so we're looking at the architecture so we give design recommendations for a soft network but based on silicon area so there's a subtle difference and it will be clear Later on as well. There's also been one or two papers about hard networks, so not a lot, and they've been mainly point designs in the space. So they're saying build a network like that and it will work well with this application, with this group of applications. We aim to do a broader and more detailed approach where we investigate the whole space of building a hard and soft network. And finally, there are some applications that leverage networks on chips, so we think there's demand for this kind of research. So our contributions in point four are to quantify the area and performance gap of the hard and soft networks. So per network component, to investigate how this will impact not, uh, network design, both soft and hard. And finally, to integrate a hard network on the FPJ and see what that entails. Right, so I'm done with the first part. Now in the second part, we'll look quickly at the network architecture and methodology then discuss the results that we got. Right, so a network is composed of routers and links, and we'll look at the router first because that's more the more complex part, right? And we actually borrow an open source implementation of a state-of-the-art, you know, high-performance router from Stanford. And by doing that, we're acknowledging that the network on chip community, you know, they have built the best router out there. They have been working on it for 10 or 15 years, so they know what to do, we just use it, right? And because we think that the FPGA has, a, has high bandwidth or high traffic requirements, we actually just we, we go for a high performance variant of this router. So we don't go for a stripped down simple router on the FPGA like most uh, previous work did. We go for the high performance beefed up one. And another advantage of that is that it will include, you know, it will be more complex. So it will include a superset of the components that you can have in implementing a network. So. So it's a more complete analysis in that sense. So we divide it into five components. So here's a block diagram of the router, a simplified block diagram. And the first component is the input module. Um, it consists of a multi-queue buffer. So basically a memory divided into separate virtual queues. Each one is called a virtual channel. And that is that consists of you know memory and some control logic and routing logic around it. And the parameters that affect this component is port width, buffer depth, and the number of virtual channels. <coughs> then we have the crossbar. That's the second component in the data path here. And that consists of multiplexers. So basically very crowded interconnect and just simple logic. Right? And the parameters that matter here are port width and the number of ports. Then we have the output modules. These are actually an optimization, an optional optimization. It's a retiming register to make the router run at a faster frequency. And it's simply just a register or a bunch of registers and some little tracking logic around it. And the relevant parameters are port width and the number of virtual channels. So that's the data path of the router. And the control unit is called the allocators. That's made up of arbiters. And these basically assign priorities to ports or virtual <coughs> channels to control the flow of, of the router. Uh, so the things that affect the area and delay here are the number of ports and the number of virtual channels. So to sum up, we have five components and we have four parameters. So we will sweep those four parameters for the five components and look at the area and delay, compare it on hard versus soft. Um, so our methodology. So we took the, um, the router components and pushed it through the whole FPGA flow taking the post-routing uh, FPGA area and delay. And that accounted for a lot of uh, packing porosity and, and a lot of other things, which the details are in the paper. Right? 
and that represents the soft area <coughs> of the delay. Uh, for the hard area and delay, we took the post synthesis results from the ASIC flow. Okay. So they're, yeah, and, the, and we do that per router component. And they're both in TSMC 65 nanometer technology. So the FPJ Stratix 3 is actually implemented in that technology, so we think it's a fair comparison. And although we push the designs through the whole FPGA flow, we only take the synthesis results from the ASIC one, and we have two reasons for that. So the first one is that it's much more complicated to put it through place and route for ASICs, so we think it, it wasn't really worth the effort. And the second thing is that the synthesis tools really are really careful in, pr in producing accurate post-synthesis results, because usually synthesis and place and route are two separate teams in companies, and you need an accurate result after synthesis before passing on the design to place and route. And the tools themselves say that they have results to within 5% of, uh, of you know, final estimates. But that wasn't enough, so we verified it against previous work by Professor, by Professor Rose and Ian Juan. And when we took their largest benchmark through our methodology, we got really close results. So that raised confidence in our methodology, and we thought that was enough. So before looking at the detailed results, let's take a look at the input module once again. So the input module consists of a bunch of small memories, and it's a critical component in designing the router because it accounts for about half its area. Okay? And yeah, and on ASICs, you just implement small memories as register arrays or flip-flop arrays. But on FPGAs, you have three options, and they give very different uh, areas. So we looked at these three options. You have registers, lot RAM, or block RAM. And on the Stratix 3, you had one register per lot. Lot RAM came in 640 bits, and block RAM was in 9 kilobits, the smallest block RAM. So we looked at the area of these three options for our input module, and plotted it to see which had the smallest area, because we wanted to favor the FPGA of that. So here you have the buffer depth on the x-axis and the area of the buffer on the y-axis. When we implemented it using registers, the area grew really quickly and it was obviously the inefficient option. When we used LUTRAM, it was much better. And you see these jumps here when you run out of depth and you start using another logic cluster implemented as LUTRAM on the FPGA. And surprisingly, when you use block RAM, it was more area efficient than both registers and lot RAM. So in terms of pure silicon area, block RAM was more efficient. And that's interesting because it contradicts previous work, which really leans towards, you know, using lot RAM for small memories. And that's what it was built for. Yeah? I guess, well, what this isn't taking into account is that you have less flexibility in choosing where to place your components because yes. lot RAM is everywhere, whereas block RAM is less Exactly. So that's the difference of, you know, deciding on pure silicon area from an architectural standpoint or on if you have more of it. So that, that's the subtle difference that I was saying in uh, comparing to previous work, right? How did we get uh, block RAM less than lot RAM for small apps like 32 by 20 should be one lab and lab is a fraction of the area of an MIK? Um, there's mm -hmm. some other soft logic in there that's being used. No, that's just the buffer area. You can't do that in one lab. 32 bits is too wide for one lab. That's too The maximum so yeah, is 20 bits. Right. But it's still, it's two labs, it's still less than your area. Okay. I can go back to the like the, the area of each one after the talk. Okay. But uh, I'm pretty confident to this. Yeah. So it was more area efficient to use block RAM. So from this, we came up with the, uh, yeah. So when we took a closer look, we found that lot RAM density is about 23 kilobits per millimeter squared, borrowed from Henry, and uh, lot RAM was 142 kilobits. So what that means is 16% utilized lot RAM is still more area efficient than a fully utilized lot RAM. So there's a big difference. Uh, and that's valid for Stratix 3. And just a disclaimer is that lot RAM could win for other points on other FPGA because you know you might have only larger lot RAM or something. So this is for Stratix 3. Maybe. But from that, we came up with the first soft design recommendation, which is to use block RAM for your input modules in the route. So now let's take a look at the real results. Yeah. Here we look at port count, so the number of ports on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, that's the area ratio. So that's the soft area divided by the hard area. 
So here we see the allocator. So the purple one is the switch allocator, and the other one is the virtual channel allocator. And as we increase the number of ports, the area gap really widens between the hard, the soft and the hard implementation, indicating that it's bad to implement a high port count in a soft network. Additionally, when we looked at the crossbar, it's very bad. So at low port count, the crossbar was about 60 times worse on the FPGA, and it jumped to 170 times worse, you know, at nine at nine ports. So, so yeah. So from this, we say, okay, high port count is inefficient in soft. Don't build a high port count. Um, and to put this in perspective, like three ports means a ring topology, for example. So a ring for a network. Five ports is a um, mesh topology. So you want to stay away from the trees or the concentrated topologies in a soft implementation. Basically. It was a different story for the width. So here we have width of each port and the area ratio on the y-axis. And we see that the area ratio of the crossbar, although it's bad, it stays pretty stable. So it doesn't get worse as you increase the width. And it actually got better for the input. <coughs> so the input module got more efficient as you increase the width of your, uh, of your data pad. So from that we say, OK, high port count is inefficient, but width is. So if you want more bandwidth, you might as well increase the width of your channels, not add more ports. Then we looked at depth. And again, we have the area ratio on the y-axis and buffer depth on the x-axis. So the only component that varied with depth was the input module. And it just got better because we're using the block RAM. And as you pack more you know, words into the block RAM, you're not really adding to the FPGA area, but you're increasing the size of your ASIC buffer. So it, get, it just gets more efficient. So the design recommend, yeah, you're filling up the block RAM. So the design recommendation is to use deep buffers if you're using block RAM for, for your input modules on the FPG. Okay, so here we summarize the recommendations. And although we didn't show the delay measurements, it, they, they mainly support the recommendations that I just said. Okay, so the first one is use block RAM. The second one, don't <coughs> use port count, use wide channels. And the third one is to increase your buffer depth because it's free on the FPG. Now we look at a summary of the results. So after sweeping all the parameters, we took a geometric mean to, to give an indication, like a one number indication of, of uh, the gap for each component. And we see it here for area. So the best component was the input module, mainly because it used these very dense block RAM. The crossbar was appalling. So it was 85 times worse on average on the FPGA. And then came the allocators, which are just logic and registers. They were still pretty bad. And because they used no hard blocks, they were around 50 times worse. Overall, the router, building a router on the FPGA is 30 times larger than that on an easy. So that's soft versus hard. And just an interesting correlation we found here. So the Stratix 3 FPGA has a lot to register ratio of 1 to 1. And the more we deviated from that ratio, the larger the area gap became. Right? So if, if you're designing for an FPGA, you might want to stick to that ratio if you, want, if you really want it to be you know, efficient in terms of silicon area. We do the same thing for delay. So we show the geometric mean results here. And they mainly support the area results, as we said. So the best component was the input module because it's centered around these fast block ramps. Uh, the worst one was the crossbar again, and on average the router was 3.6 times slower on the FPGA than it was on uh, the ASIC hard implementation. Okay, so now to my favorite part, integrating the hard network with the FPGA. So that's when we connect our network with the FPGA wire. And then I'll just conclude the talk and talk about future work. Okay, so we looked at our results again and asked the question, what do we want to harden? What do we want to implement hard on the FPGA and what do we want to leave soft? So at first glance you see that the crossbar and the allocators, which account for half the area of the router, are very bad, are the worst, uh, are the worst things to implement on the FPGA. So we, thought, so we said, okay, might as well harden those. In addition, the critical path is actually in one of them. So if we harden this component, then we will be speeding up the rally. So the results suggest that a mixed implementation would be very efficient. 
Um, so the mixed implementation includes both hard and soft components. So let's see what that looks like. So we took a typical router, it has five ports, 32 bits for each channel. It has two virtual channels and 10 buffered ports. And a complete hard implementation was 30 times better and five times faster for this you know, design point. And when we looked at the mixed implementation, it was only it was less than two times better area, and about 2.5 times faster. So not great results, but we still get a gain, right? So what are we doing here? We we hardened the, the allocators and the crossbar and left the input and output modules soft. So what now? How do we connect the hard and soft components? So that's the main issue. So these numbers aren't really representative of what's going on. And more importantly, how efficient is the hard implementation and the mixed implementation after accounting for this interconnection? Right? So after crunching some numbers, it turns out the mixed implementation is just not worth it. You'll never have you know, an attractive enough number to tell people to actually harden a bunch of allocators and crossbars on the FPJ. So we diverted our attention to a completely hard network. Okay, and what we did there is that we used the same interconnection structure for you know for a logic block to, to connect our router. So that has two levels of programmable muxing on the input and one level of programmable muxing on the output. And so it will look something like this. And after accounting you know for the area of all that programmable muxing of the input and output for all the different ports you have on a on a router, it turned out to be nine times the area of a logic block. So these blue ones are logic block. This drawing is actually to scale, so the router would be would occupy the area equivalent to nine logic blocks. And we looked at you know the intersection of wires, so it actually gets enough wires coming in and out of it, so it doesn't produce any routing choke points. It's just it, it has the same routing or interconnection flexibility as a logic. And so in an FPGA, you'll have many of those, obviously. And now they're connected, so routers are connected to the FPGA fabric through regular routing, so the regular wires on the FPGA. <coughs> In addition, they're connected to other routers also through that regular routing. So we wanted to see how fast that is. So on Stratix 3, and I think on most FPGAs, the clock is actually capped at 730 megahertz. So we said, okay, so that's our target. We want to space out the routers so that they run at the speed. So we looked at the slowest wires on the FPJ, the slowest, you know, length four wires on the <coughs> FPJ, simply because we had a lot of them. There was no chance that we weren't going to be able to achieve a route using those slow wires. And they represent the worst case. Right? And it turns out we can cross one ninth of the FPJ vertical dimension, that's about two and a half millimeters, using these slow wires. So if we space out the routers in an eight by eight network, for example, and that's good enough. It will still hit the target of the maximum, you know, clock frequency on the FPGA. And just a, a couple of numbers from the research we're doing now is that if you use the faster wires on the FPGA, that's the C12 interconnect, that doubles that distance. And if you use hardened, dedicated wires, that quadruples that distance, uh, like easily. Okay, so in the picture here, I assume the mesh for the interconnection topology. But because we're using the, you know, the FPGA routing for connecting the routers, we can implement any topology that we want. So we can implement a ring topology, for example. We can even implement two different networks. So this is a yeah, pseudo butterfly network, for example. And we can have two of them. There is no restriction. We'll just pre-program the routing table in each router, and it will work. Right? Okay. We can also have a fully custom topology. Uh, so we think that's a strength in, in you know, using soft interconnect with a hardened route instead of using dedicated things. So here, is, here are the numbers again. So a hard network was 30 times more efficient for our baseline parameters and five times faster. But after including the interconnect, these numbers obviously changed. So, yeah. so it dropped from 30 times more efficient to 22 times more efficient, which is still a considerable gain of a hard network. And we're now limited by the FPGA's clock frequency at 730 megahertz, but still 4.7 times faster than a soft network. 
Okay, to put these numbers in perspective, we look at a 64 node network on the latest FPGA. So we, we, we think it would be implemented in one of those you know, new, fast, large FPGAs. So consider a 64 node network, that's an 8 by 8 network. If implemented soft, it will use the area equivalent to 12,500 apps or logic blocks. Whereas a hard network, even after accounting for the interconnect, uses exactly 576 logic blocks. That's a big difference. In terms of percentage, that's a third of the, of the logic blocks on your 